So we've delved a lot into the past for insights, and now we're confronting the challenges of the present head on, as we always do. This morning, we are going to turn to what's ahead, though, and spend a few minutes thinking about and imagining about what the future of health and well being could look like. As a fantasy genre of, you know, person who really loves that, um, I don't want to spend too much time in the potential dystopia, but the potential that exists. And so, to do that, we've assembled a stellar panel of people whose work is not only to imagine the future, but to take action and encourage others to get there. You're going to hear a bit more about their work from the spheres of art, activism, advocacy, and more, and about the strategies they enact to achieve change for people and communities facing barriers to health and well being. Change is itself changing, and uh, change is itself changing people. Hmm. Um, and we have to recognize, adapt, and embrace new ways of getting things done. It's essential, in fact, if we're going to make sure that health equity is front of mind for decision makers, influencers, so that real system change can happen. This group today is going to give us insight into what those evolving paths for change can look like and how we can harness them to serve our collective vision, the best possible health and well being for everyone living in Ontario. So, after you hear from the panel, we're also going to have a lively discussion with them, I have no doubt, led by Anu Radha Verma, who some of you may already know from her role as chair of the board at Parkdale Queen West CHC in Toronto, project coordinator of the Inclusive Leadership and Governance Project at the Alliance for Healthier Communities, an active tweeter from yesterday. Um, so thank you for continuing to do that. But today she is taking her formal board chair hat off and she is going to help us uh, guide us based on her wealth of experience from the sector and beyond. Her work and her work in community organizing is focused on the issues of social justice, including race, gender, sexuality, migration, health, poverty, and the environment. Anu Radha has worked with a diverse set of organizations, including the Indian Youth Climate Network, Pride Toronto, Princess Margaret Cancer Center, the Ontario Council of Agencies serving immigrants. Cancer Care Ontario, Students for Barrier-Free Access, and more. And she is also the Community Arts Curator for Social Change at the Art Gallery of Mississauga, and dreams and works towards a world that is fundamentally different. And I am grateful for that perspective that she brings to the world. So please join me in warmly welcoming Anu Radha Verma. Oh wow, you are awake. This is great. <laughs> this is great. I was expecting some good morning. So um, thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks everyone for having me and looking bright and beautiful eyed right now. Um, it's great to be here in a room full of uh, community health champions. Uh, it's nice to see people I know. It's always lovely also to see people who I don't know, and I look forward to hopefully connecting on our last day of our conference. So um, you heard a little bit about my work already from Michelle, but I just wanted to say what I really appreciate about the opportunity to moderate this panel and share space with incredible activists and organizers um, is the broad perspectives that people bring from outside of the healthcare sector. So my own work has been in lots of different places, both in Canada and India, um, and it's also been across sectors, and I'm really appreciative for the ways in which our sector can be informed and enriched by work from lots of different places. So we've got some really great voices um, to share their experiences and insights. So let's meet the panel. First up, we have Max Fine Day. You should say woo at this point. <laughs> yeah. So Max is a Nahihiao activist from the Sweetgrass First Nation. He's passionate about youth leadership development, theories of change making, and increasing access to ceremonies for indigenous youth. Max is currently serving as the Executive Director of Canadian Roots Exchange, a national charity that delivers reconciliation programming to Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth. Let's give a proper round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, we have Faiza Abdeloy, who's an immigrant from Algeria and an active member of the diverse Francophone community in Ontario. Faiza is the founder of Next Level Impact Consulting and the president of the board of the Ontario Movement of Francophone Immigrant Women. 
FISA is committed to the economic well-being, health, and civic engagement of women in a minority context. Let's give FISA a glory. One more thing. And I know in your programs, and you would have seen a little bit on Twitter, that we were hoping to have Cyrus Marcus Ware with us on the panel. Unfortunately, Cyrus couldn't be here, but let's give him a big round of applause. So now that we've got our panel assembled, we're going to take a look into the future. And we don't mean crystal ball look. We're actually going to have some really concrete conversations about what is possible. Each panelist is going to have between seven and ten minutes to speak about their current work uh, and how they're getting things done differently. Then I'll spend a few minutes throwing out some wicked questions. Um, and then we'll have a conversation amongst ourselves. And after that, of course, you get a chance to ask. So as you know, there's mics set up around the room, and Michelle will be helping us to direct traffic when we get to the audience question and answer period. So let's get us started. Faiza, let's hear from you first. Bonjour tout le monde. Ah, there are so many. So, some bonjour. Um, good morning. I will speak in English for, for this morning. Um, I want to thank you first for inviting me today and offering me a new space actually to talk about our work, my work, and the different hats that I'm wearing today in front of you. Um, I am uh, an immigrant, as uh, you can probably assume from the way I look. I'm a francophone from my accent, and I'm also a mom. Some of you have seen the little one talking, walking around, so that's the solution that I, that I found for, for today. But I'm happy that he is here because he is obviously my future and uh, one of the top reasons of my work here in Canada since I arrived nine years ago. I'm, uh, I'm here to uh, share the voice and share the, the lives of uh, the woman that I have the honor to represent. Uh, being the president of the board of an organization that will celebrate 15 years in a few months. It's called MOFI, Ontario Movement for Francophone Immigrant Women. It's not called association. The word movement means that really everything that we do in this organization come from our daily life, our daily struggle, and really the things that, that come from our, from our guts, I will say. Because everything, every subject that we're taking on, every challenge that we're taking on through research, training, and advocacy come from our lives and, and what, we, what we notice and what we want to change. And um, what we want is to be able as Francophone immigrant women in Ontario to live in security, respected, healthy in a province that we can call home and engaged. Um, first, I'm going to talk as, as a woman. When I heard uh, Future of Health and that I had to talk about it or present you some of my work, uh, some of our work this morning, there are so many thoughts that were coming. And uh, as a woman, I want to start uh, addressing the thing, the issue of uh, sex and gender sexual health, sexual education, and of course, sexual harassment. Gender discrimination in the healthcare industry, in prevention, in care, and, in, and under representation in leadership. There are so many realities that as a non-professional um, in, in healthcare, I mean, just as a, as a patient, as a citizen, that are touching me and that are quite, want me to scream uh, because in 2018, I can't really understand uh, what's, what's happening in this country and what's happening in this situation when it comes to our health and living in healthy, commu in healthy communities. Um, if it is supposed to take 170 years to achieve gender equity in incomes, that's what they say, 170 years, how many years must we wait to decrease the higher right, uh, risk of her heart attacks that women have to face, or to have the pain of a racialized woman taking into consideration and receive the adequate treatment when she arrives in an emergency room, because those are the things that we hear still, where would we, um, how could we still wait for uh, eight years to receive a diagnosis of endometri endometriosis, which is one of the issues that women face, and one of so many that are not taking into consideration when, we, when it comes to funding, when it comes to research, or sp or s just hearing about it and talking about it. Um, 
just one of the issues that that uh, we we can uh, we can notice. So, is uh, if future is about more equity and it must be, where do we start? W how we address this in our organization is, as I said, through three pillars: the research, the trainings, and the and the advocacy. What we've done, for example, is uh, working with OCASI last year, OCASI being the umbrella organization for uh, settlement services. They do work and, and, and support all the, um, all the uh, organization working with immigrants, with refugees. One of the issues that we could see is uh, sexual harassment, and it was way before people were talking about, uh, about it so much in the, in the press, uh, through the Weinstein, um, um, I would say tragedy, because it was a tragedy and, and dramatic for the women. So we started to work on this as, uh, as collaborators. And the thing was to understand and to find the best way to talk about sexual harassment in different places, being uh, with inside the home, uh, inside the workplace, inside the public space, and encompasses with immigrant and refugee women coming into this country. Because there are a different, uh, they are uh, they are living uh, a different reality um, when it comes to understanding what sexual harassment. If I think about uh, francophone women, for example, coming from a different reality, from a different culture, sexual harassment doesn't mean uh, the same thing in France, in Algeria, or in Congo that it means obviously in, in Canada. And even in Canada, this definition has been improving and has been. Uh, um, yeah, ev evolving, I'm sorry. So how could we address this? How can we share, how can we start a discussion that is so difficult? How can we start also a discussion that will connect with the women that we want to touch? And for this, we had to go innovative and we had to go through um, uh, a tool that will connect not only on the topic itself, because talking about uh, sexual harassment is not an easy thing for a lot of people, but going through the emotions and going through the stories. So we decided to use graphic novel. That's something that um, really touches uh, the women, really touches uh, the service providers also, because the stories that have been created and that have been uh, produced for this graphic novel were coming from the woman itself. So when we're talking about changing the future and changing the behavior and the attitudes toward a certain challenge, it's really about co-creating. We can't anymore have something that is just developed from the top and not using or not involving the woman living this story themselves. And uh, we had groups. One of the things that was interesting, right from the get-go, Okasi associated Mofif to this project, but not through translation. It wasn't about having a, um, uh, a document uh, created for, Frank for Anglophones and then just translated in French. It was really about understanding what are the different realities. Uh, those uh, French and English are obviously the two official languages of, uh, of Canada, and that's something that will um, that is embedded in the constitution and then can change. So we have we had the opportunity to develop our own tool with our own stories, women sharing their stories, women sharing their thoughts, women sharing their issues, and that that have been the the the, the, the base of, of the story that we had. And sharing and reading those stories after with the women participating to the event created a link and created a, an emotion that had opened the discussion about sexual harassment within the workplace because that's what, that's what we wanted. Also another thing that we've done is, uh, is uh, research. Research on sexual uh, health for women is not something that, we, that is done that often and we had the support of Reflet Salveo doing this. What we discovered uh, through this research and that we uh, we done in Regent Park and Moss Park last year is that uh, when it comes to understanding for an immigrant woman, when it comes to understanding the system arriving here as a woman, there are so many, so many different things that have to be taken into consideration. Not only the way the, the service is given, is offered, but also um, the, c the culture. Uh, also, um, the, the importance that will be given to some, some things uh, considered as health and some not. For example, um, um, 
if I, if I talk about uh, menopause or prevention, because the future is also about this uh, for, for a lot of us, um, there is not, <laughs> I'm sorry, but there are, no, uh, there are no open discussion about this right now. So what do we do in French, obviously, but also for all the women to talk about this and to get ready for the next stage? There are not enough prevention. There are not enough uh, education. In, in any of the subject, and that's where uh, you as service providers and as community health center are so important. Um, last point maybe that I want to, uh, because it's uh, two minutes, I think, um, that I want to share before the, the panels that will give me more opportunity to, to go into depth, is um, one of the discussion that I keep having with immigrants, not, dep not depending of where they're coming from, is about food, is about health, um, in terms of, uh, of, um, of the food that is available here. One of the research keeps showing that immigrants arrive in this country with a better health, but after five years or after a few years, and the longer they stay here, the worse uh, their uh, health is becoming. And that is not only um, an issue of um, us, being uh, more, I don't know, eating more vegetables or things like this. It's also a policy issue where we have to be able to offer uh, new laws and new regulation so that we, um, we, uh, we have access to um, better food when we are right here. Um, sorry, I'm mixed up a bit in my notes um, between English and French also. So, um, before going to the panel, what I want to say uh, to, to end is that um, whatever we do, whatever we discuss with the women we're working with, one of the things that comes out is that they arrive in a country where they think that women's health, women's rights will be kind of perfect because that's what we hear from outside and that's the image that Canada can have. One of the points that um, has been stressed in the discussion that we had is um, that we have to remember that actually women's participation into uh, the civic, um, civic uh, actions or into uh, the different areas in their lives, it's, it's very new, even in Canada. If I think again about sexual harassment and consent, for example, uh, consent will be something that has been recognized, uh, having consent within the couple has only been recognized in 82 in Canada. And that's not that long, in, that's not that much in the past. So um, when you have an immigrant woman coming into your services, please remember that she's coming, yes, from a culture where some, of some, some things are not as it is in Canada, but please remember that also the struggle is for every woman, uh, including a Canadian born and Canadian from many generations, because that will create the link where they, there are no judgment actually. Um, when, when we offer them the services. Uh, finally, we do have a new, um, a new government since last month, uh, since last week, and in a few months we're gonna uh, see the changes that will be implemented. Um, for our organization, one of the things that we are really uh, concerned about is the understanding of uh, some of the, the um, uh, some of the um, uh, files, not files, some of the issues, yes, thank you. Some of the issues that we, we, we will be facing. It's not uh, francophone being a francophone in this, uh, or in this province is not something that will change. It's not francophone are everywhere, and we're not only in Quebec, because that's one of the sentences that we, that we heard. Um, it's not also, um, when, we, when we work on sexual harassment, one of the key points is consent. Uh, that takes education, so I'm also very worried about um, sexual education being maybe taking off of schools. And uh, if it is, we will have to find another space uh, to, uh, to uh, address uh, this, uh, this, um, this issue. Um, one more... Um, one more thing um, that we're working on that I'm thinking about right now is uh, that um, a lot of uh, women 
are a lot of immigrant women, refugees women are separated from their kids. I don't, I, I do have the chance that to have my son with me, but it's not the case for a lot of refugees. Um, and uh, we are working on uh, change, policy changes, uh, to have a, um, a, a an improvement in the way that the women will be uh, accepted and have their kids actually with them because it creates so many, uh, a, an impact so negative in their mental health that there is absolutely no way for them uh, without their kids to improve their life and to have a job and to uh, access to education. And, um, and uh, that's, that's it, I think, at this point. Thank you. Do I have to go up to the podium? No? Good? Um, I'm always, uh, I want to thank Faiza for, for that, that talk. I'm always so impressed, um, you know, when, uh, when somebody who is multilingual can get up, uh, get up this early in the morning and, and deliver a speech in a second. I don't speak any languages good. So, you know, this is, <laughs> is you know, going to be a decline here. I want to say uh, Tuao. Uh, tuao Kakyao. Nasiga sun kisigao pisi mawasa se gua. Nawi kasko tinia. Nagoa triko tinia. Nipin naskumun. Nani wako magana. Kegua nitoto makota. Aya mamo tawi mau. Nyo kisigawa no kota. Kinaskum tinoa. Friends and relatives, uh, what I just said in my language is something uh, you've become accustomed uh, to hearing in, in recent years uh, something, the way we start these discussions, these important conversations. You know what I'm talking about. I just reviewed the breakfast. It was good, right? The eggs were <laughs> solid. The bacon was just crispy enough. My friends and relatives, what I said in my language is my family has so often told me to do is to explain where I come from. And I told you in my language that my name is Max Finday. I come from uh, the Sweetgrass First Nation, and that's in Treaty 6 territory, uh, what's now known as Saskatchewan. And we are uh, we're quite famous, actually. Maybe some of you have heard of Sweetgrass First Nation. I'm seeing some, some nodding. We're actually uh, uh, very famous for having the cutest Cree boys in the country. So that's our... <laughs> That's our claim to fame. Uh, friends and relatives, I, I want to, I also in my language acknowledge our, our kind and loving creator for giving us this day uh, to talk about these important issues, uh, to talk about uh, the idea of health, to talk about your roles in, in uh, keeping people healthy and in uh, helping people to, to get healthy, to stay healthy. I thanked our kind and loving creator and asked him to open up our hearts and our minds to solutions and to ideas, to things that we haven't yet heard. I want to acknowledge uh, the indigenous people in the room who are, who, are a part of, uh, who are a part of this work, who work hard every day, who uh, oftentimes faced obstacle and struggle, who oftentimes are underappreciated, whose, whose knowledge is undervalued, and whose ways of knowing uh, are just beginning to be seen and understood by the systems and the institutions uh, that we work in. Now, we're going to have a bit of time uh, for questions and answers uh, later on in this panel. I'd encourage you. You know, I want to say... Uh, to all of you, if you have a question, uh, to, to not be shy, to try and, try and not be shy and, and to ask your question. This is, uh, this is, a, this is a safe space, you know? Um, I, I have the great privilege of, of going around this country and speaking with uh, people not unlike yourselves about reconciliation, about this moment in time that we find ourselves in. I also want to acknowledge that almost all of you, 
if not each and, each and every one of us, went through the schooling system having not learned about Indigenous people, having not been taught about the treaties and your responsibility to live up to them. I want to acknowledge uh, that this is an introduction. It's like getting to know someone. This is the, the, the start of a conversation and relationship that hopefully charts a new path forward. I'm the executive director of Canadian Roots Exchange, and we're an organization that does reconciliation work with uh, young people right across this country. And for all of you who are on your smartphones right now, the least you can do is like the page. Uh, so <laughs> what's different about the generation of young people in this country today is that they have the opportunity to learn about Indigenous people. Indigenous students in this province and in this country have the opportunity to be proud of who they are, share with their classmates about what makes Indigenous people special. We're not only handsome, we're also very smart, we're ingenuitous. You know? um, we have that opportunity to get to know one another for the first time. Many of you see my people day to day. And oftentimes it isn't in that way that I vision, in the way that, that the indigenous people in this room hope for, the way uh, that we will get to, I believe, in the next 50 years. And too often when you see my people, it is, it is on the street. And too often when you, when you are brought my people to care for, um, they are in ill health. I was in Canmore last week. Beautiful Canmore, Alberta. I'd never been before. It's sort of like a, a poor man's Banff. But it was still nice, you know, it's still nice. <laughs> and uh, and I, was, uh, I was speaking uh, to a group of healthcare professionals. And uh, they were all from, from Western Canada. I had the opportunity to ask them questions. Unfortunately, you're just too great of a group for me to be able to do that today. I had the opportunity to ask them about their experiences. Had the, had the opportunity uh, to talk about the place that we're in today as, as an industry, as, as, as healthcare providers, we talked about what they see day to day. You know, I really appreciate the honesty of folks when, when I'm able to go and speak with them. One, one person put up their hand and said, Max, why can't we just get over it? This happened in the past. Why do I have to sit through Aboriginal awareness training? Why do I have to Learn whose territory I'm on. We should all be Canadians. And I see some people shaking their head at this comment. This happens more often than we think. The only thing worse than that is that people think this, but they don't say it. I had an opportunity to tell them a story much like I'm telling you now, and that's the problem with inviting free people to come and talk, right? You know, we tell stories. This, this person who's keeping track of the time right now is just worried right now, you know? He's like, <laughs> he has about two and a half minutes to wrap this up, you know? And I'm gonna do my absolute best, I promise you. <laughs> you know, on Monday, uh, it was 10 years. It was a 10 year anniversary of the apology to residential school survivors, of which my father was one. I'm the first one in my line not to be taken from my parents, not to be taken from my community to these schools, not to be um, robbed of my identity and my ceremonies, and up to Nehewe in my language, which I speak a little bit of. I had the opportunity to tell that healthcare provider in Canmore 
that the last residential school closed in 1996. And that was the year I started kindergarten. I had the opportunity to tell that healthcare provider in Canmore that today, as we sit here in this room, there are three times as many indigenous children in state care than there ever were in residential school. I had the opportunity to tell that healthcare provider that on the United Nations Human Development Index, with, which measures things like uh, health and income and you know all the usual suspect statistics that Canada ranks between third and fifth in the world, and that's why we're so proud to be Canadian, because we live in one of the best countries in the world. Well, when you apply those same statistics to my people, we tumble. We tumble down that list and sit between 60 eighth and, and 76th. And those are well into third world condition. Thank you so much. And uh, <laughs> friends and relatives, what I, what I had the opportunity in that moment to share with that health care provider is that we cannot get over something that is still happening today. You know, indigenous people are some of the most uh, resilient people in this country. Uh, we, if you go into a First Nations community, I often say you'll see a joy. You'll see laughter. You'll see people doing what they can with what they have. And it is much. In this great story that is Canada over the last 151 years, uh, it was very unlikely that indigenous people would survive all that has happened, all that continues to happen today. Yet here we are. I have many more stories to tell, but I'll end with this. I told that health care provider that for the last 151 years, indigenous people have had their hands extended, waiting for Canada to grab it in peace and friendship, in the spirit of partnership and prosperity, uh, hoping only for what was originally agreed to when non-Indigenous people came to this land. Peace, prosperity, and mutual benefit. You face challenges every day in this work. We know that you are under-resourced. We know that, that you have mountains of paperwork to do. We know that life is busy. We must consider, as healthcare providers, as an alliance, how we better incorporate reconciliation, how we better tell these stories, how we recognize that those people that you serve every day are not poor people with needs who are suffering from illnesses like um, tuberculosis in some cases, suffering from illnesses uh, like the flu, suffering from illnesses like addictions, they are indigenous people with rights who are suffering, as we all suffer, from a case of colonialism. And it's incumbent upon all of us to try to find, find the cure. So with that, I'll say, and I very much look forward to your questions. You ready? Yeah. We're ready. I just realized I have some flyaways here. Holy <laughs> smokes. I gave a whole talk with flyaways. Okay, yeah, now I'm ready. <laughs> There's a very subtle wind machine right in front. It's, it's, it's for the look. I, you were channeling Beyonce, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have lots of questions to ask both of you, but I'm going to actually toss them aside for a quick second based on some of the things that you've said. And I want to just offer up the kind of approach that I'll be bringing to this space. As a non-black person of color whose um, being here is facilitated by settler colonialism and as someone who's really interested in the conversations between indigenous people and non-indigenous folks of color, I think there's something interesting that we can, we can offer and talk about today. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but what I want to do first is actually ask you about language. Mm. Yeah. So maybe one of the things that I've certainly heard in, in the dive sports spaces that I'm in is over time, the access to language changes for people, in particular for immigrant communities and lots of South Asian folks that I know, in particular the queer and trans South Asian folks that I hang out with. Um, we struggle with, with access to language and what it means to have access to your language as a way of articulating identity. And here, you know, both of you are kind of talking through in your initial comments and through your talk about what it means to have access, not have access to language, to be expected to be, move through the world, use lexicons that maybe isn't the right one for who we are or what we're doing. So just love to know your kind of thoughts and feedbacks about language. So, and Faisal, sure. let's start with you. Yeah, um, how will you rate my level of English based on what I shared just before? Yeah. Oh my God, no, yes. no, no, no. Not at all. So uh, believe it or not, I can actually give talks way better than this one. But that, what I wanted to show, <laughs> no, ser seriously, like I give, I give workshops, like English is really a language that I use every day in my work, even in, like with my son, with my neighbors and things like this. But what happens when I have a bit of stress and I was really creating on myself this type of stress uh, before talking, the level of, the, the, the type of expression, the, the sentences that I couldn't find this morning talking to you, it's exactly what happens to me when I'm in an emergency room. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I can be like rated seven or eight in a professional environment, but when I, ar I arrive in the emergency room, I just lose my, my, my words. I really lose my words. And there, there is something that terrifies me as a francophone, part of a minority, even if it's an official language, being in Ontario, it's calling 911. Mm. And when I say terrifies me, it really terrifies me. If something happened to me, something happened to my son, God forbid, I'm not even sure I will find even one word in English. Mm -hmm. I go to the image, I just lose this, this capacity to, to, to talk in, my, in, in, in a language that I learned. I'm also terrified about when we talk about future, yes, I talked about menopause and things like this, but let's talk about our elders. Francophones arrive here, they live in this country. Immigrants, one of the thing, oh, French, 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 but uh, please keep in mind that immigrants, when we arrive here, immigrants or refugees, we are told that French is an official language and that we can expect services. So it's kind of like our, in our brain, not having this type of services, it's like it, it, it requires an, an, an extra effort, an extra energy that we don't always have. And um, my husband, for example, to be very personal, uh, he, once a few, few weeks ago, he was like, mom, you're so activist. Like it, you're so, so, so talking about French, French services all, always, always. Why is it that important? He's French, like fr an accent, like a very thick, French accent, right? <laughs> Dad has a very thick accent. I looked at him, he's older than me, and I said, I'm sorry, that's the place that we decided to call home. Our son is born here, we're gonna live here, we, he's most certainly gonna die here. One day, you may get a disease from, like when you got, oh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get older, you may have a disease that's gonna come back. It's not the English that you're using in your, in your life every day. It's gonna go back to French. I want to make sure that you have French services when you're gonna get to this point because it's in the constitution. And that's why I'm so active. And uh, yes, you can see that I can speak French <laughs> when I'm not in the sun. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for, for me, Engl uh, English. Uh, English isn't that important to me. You know, you can hear the way I talk. I don't speak English that well. But uh, for me, uh, when my language is is so important and, and you go and uh, you talk to indigenous people, so many of them will be trying to regain that language. You know, I often say to folks who I talk to that uh, Cree uh, and, and the indigenous languages uh, that we see in these territories, um, they're only, uh, you know, in, in Canada and, and, the, and the northern parts of, of the states. It's the only place in the world that, uh, that these languages exist. And yet they face extinction because of, uh, because of these policies that I've spoken with you about today. You know, uh, talking about services is, is uh, crucial.
for indigenous people. And I think that's where we're getting to in, the, in these next years. How do we make sure that indigenous people, especially our, our old ones, are never placed in that, in that horrible, uh, scary situation of calling 911, having an emergency, being brought into a hospital, and having no one understand them? having no idea who to call to get an interpreter. Beyond speaking our languages, I want to talk about uh, styles of communication mm -hmm. and culturally competent styles of, of communication. I was speaking with another healthcare professional out in, out in, uh, out in uh, Vancouver, I think it was, and, uh, and she said, well, you know, I get so many native patients, she said. And I don't really care about terminology, you know? But I just, you know, I thought it was sort of funny she said native. My rule is as long as the F word isn't in front of whatever word you choose, that's fine. <laughs> and uh, and she, uh, she said, but native patients, they're just so stubborn. They don't want me to help them. They're an impediment to their own uh, well-being, she said to me. I was like, well, that's pretty bold to say to a native guy, you know? <laughs> this, is, uh, this lady had no fear. Um, <laughs> which, you know, I appreciate and respect her. And, uh, and so we started a conversation about, well, how did you approach the patient, you know? Uh, how, did you, how did you speak with them? What kind of questions uh, did you ask? And then as, as she told me how she engaged with that patient, I imagined uh, my auntie. And I imagined uh, my, my uncle, maybe the most stubborn man alive, uh, which, it, which is a cultural trait of the Cree. I don't know, you know, maybe, <laughs> and uh, Cree men especially. And I thought, when this woman comes in without introducing herself and, and there's no clue of who you are or what your role is, and you ask, what's wrong? Say what you know. What's happening today? And what brought you here? Yeah, what brought you here? All these questions. Mm -hmm. I can imagine my family shrugging, right? Because they don't know who you are. They don't know what's brought you into that room. They don't know that you're here to help. And you know, we we have to acknowledge the harms of of institutions. And it's so funny to me always when you poll Canadians, what's the, what's the thing we're most proud of? It's our universal health care system, right? Of course it is. Uh, for indigenous people, these places are, are, are intimidating. They're scary. Um, they don't know. Um, they don't want to be there. They don't recognize anyone there. There's oftentimes not a lot of indigenous people working there, right? How are they supposed to feel safe? Just one last uh, uh, story about speaking to uh, some healthcare providers. I asked a room of, of uh, about 100 um, nurses. How many of you have seen a colleague do something that was prejudiced against indigenous people? Everyone but two people raised their hand. This is the state of our, our healthcare system that we're so proud of. And it's not just being able to go in there and say, Ani, Tanse about being able to speak in a way that isn't intimidating, yeah. speak in a way that is welcoming, speak in a way that allows indigenous people, indigenous patients, to feel that they can trust you with their care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm obsessed with time. Yeah. Not that time, not Farnes, there's a question with time. I'm obsessed with what was, what could be, where we are right now. And um, both of you have kind of touched on the idea, this trajectory of time or the temporal. I don't think we can have a conversation about the future without thinking about times past and times present. And with this desire of moving forward, you know, getting over it, and I think for some of you who are in the room, for Dr. Charmaine, um, Nelson's conversation yesterday, certainly I felt in the energy people being like, why are we talking about slavery in Canada? That mm. was there. We, and uh, as a non-black person of color, I, I want to acknowledge the, the ways in which even 
um, South Asian folks and other non-black people of color perpetuate that conversation when they come to Canada and believe it's a place that uh, colonization hasn't impacted them the same way. So sometimes there can be a tension or a difficulty in having this conversation about the past to ask those in power to confront the past and current harms. The question, and I'll ask you to start, Max, is what could we do to create and nurture spaces for people to have difficult conversations about the past? Yeah. Well, you know, Canadians, we, we have a funny idea about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we, we hold very, very, uh, uh, you know, we, what, we like about Cana what we like about ourselves is that we're not American, mm -hmm. right? That's, a, that's like, an, uh, that's like a, a national cultural at attribute, you know? We're very proud of ourselves. And when we go traveling, we make sure to have as many Canadian flags on our person at one time as we can, <laughs> right? All the way down to the sock. <laughs> Just so people don't mistake us for Americans, right? That's very important to us. And uh, it's such a funny idea um, because we think of ourselves as this good guy. Mm -hmm. We think of ourselves as the hero. We think of ourselves as uh, a leader in human rights, uh, not only at home, but also abroad, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the global stage. We're the nerdy kid in class who's just trying to mind his own business and get the work done, make the, make the school. We'd be the hall monitor, you know? <laughs> if this was an elementary school, we'd be the hall monitor. We'd be that guy. And, uh, and so we don't like to think that a genocide happened here. Mm -hmm. And I say that word, genocide. And I use it purposefully, and I know what that means. A genocide happened in this country. It continues to happen. And it's such a shock, because whether it was four generations ago or whether it was last week, we have countless people here who have fleed genocide, who have fleed harm and tragedy. You all have your own stories of why your families came uh, to these lands, we don't like to acknowledge that the same thing happened here and, uh, and every non-Indigenous person sitting in this room benefits from it. When we think about how we have to make space for these conversations in our work, in our lives, you know, I tell Canadians that reconciliation isn't nine to five, Monday to Friday with a 15 minute break for coffee in the morning and in the afternoon, you know? If you are truly committed to this work, if you see the inequities that I speak of on this stage reflected in your work, even if you don't, I'm telling you about them now, they exist. Then you must uh, commit yourselves, not only to advocacy, but also to action. And Canadians will ask me, well, what can I do? We live, uh, we are so lucky to live in a generation, in a, in a time where, you know, any answer to any question you want is available. We live in a time where our most knowledgeable elder, Grandma Google, can tell you just about <laughs> anything you'd ever want to know. You can learn about residential schools. You can learn about uh, the treaties. You can learn about the 60s scoop. You can also learn about all of the good things that are happening in community today. You can do this individually if you are, if you are shy and you don't want to talk about it openly. You can, you can do this in a group at your work or at your place of, of worship. You can do this at your, at your tennis club. You can do it anywhere. But we have to start weaving reconciliation into every aspect of our life, that acknowledgement and restoring the relationship to its rightful place. What you just said really resonates. I myself, as you said, uh, from Algeria. I left Algeria in 1860. There was a civil war at that time. 
And uh, Algeria is independent since uh, 1962. It has been colonized by France uh, for uh, um, uh, more than 100 years. And yet, French is the, is the language that I consider as my mother tongue. Um, the country I went to to feel safe was France. I stayed there for 15 years. When I arrived here nine years ago, I had no idea of what happened, no idea. And I actually, uh, I'm still shocked that I actually started to hear about it only four years ago. Mm. And it broke my heart. And I have to say that it broke my heart because I, was, I questioned myself on my right to be on this land. Because being colonized, I was becoming the colon. And that, when I, when I say it broke my heart, it, well, it really what, it took me like through a lot of thinking. What can I do as also an immigrant here, a Francophone immigrant where, yes, I say the, the language is official, but I do understand and I do recognize and I do discover also why this language and how this language is also an, an official language in Canada. And uh, it is my role and it is my, my duty and, and we starting this work with, with uh, some, some women, some members of our, our organization to see how we, re how we participate also to this, mm -hmm. to this, uh, to this um, journey, I guess, I don't know which mm -hmm. word I, I could use, um, to, to, un to understand, to create the links and to uh, become allies. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure I'm not using the right words just because I'm just in, in beginning this, 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 uh, mm -hmm. this thing. But uh, yeah, as a, as a I, I still consider it as a, as a colony. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one difficult uh, discussion that we have to, to get within our communities. Um, Francophone community, when we talk about Francophones, we're talking about more than 30 uh, countries of origin. Uh, French, yes, French from France, and the rest, most of them, uh, well, we have Quebecois, we have Franco Algerian, but the rest of them are coming from North Africa, from Africa, um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And we do have issues of racism. We do have issues of discrimination. Let's face it, let's talk about it, and let's address it. Within our Francophone community, we do have issues. We do have challenges with this. And we do have to, um, we all, we're starting to open this discussion, uh, what it is to be a Franco-Ontarian when we don't have the color of the majority uh, where what it is to uh, also contribute within into this country where there are so many stereotypes on being an African. Oh, what are you bringing here? What, are the, what is your culture? What is your religion bringing into this country? So how do we address that? By creating um, a safe space where, well, it's a, it's a buzzword, safe space, but it does exist, like having this trust uh, created um, to, um, to talk about each other, to talk about our histories. As I said in the, in the intro, uh, for, for women, um, reminding women that grew up here that the rights that they achieved and, they, and that they can live on are not, um, are not uh, arriving since, like they, it, it, it's, really, it's really short. It's just a 30 years period that there are rights uh, for, for women. We talk about uh, 100 years for vote, but uh, for Native women, I think it was 72 only for that part of them. So let's not forget when we say, oh, 100 years for vote. No, it's not 100, for 100 years for vote for any woman, for every woman. There has been steps for this too, and 82 was one of the steps, and uh, 76 for the, the right to have card, uh, credit card and things like this. Why do, I why do I say that? It's because when you have a lucid uh, view and understanding of what's your history and where you're at and when, where you're coming from, you also have a more um, open way or just a yeah, more lucid way to welcome the stories and to welcome the realities of others. Um, difficult situation, difficult discussion if we talk about uh, um, cul culture that are associated with my religion, with Islam. My goodness, those are tough discussions also to have. But please remember, again, that women's rights were not that, uh, that, uh, that strong f just a few years ago. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's easier, I think, to just learn and just be open and, and, and trust it. Mm -hmm. so thank you. I will get there. Thank you.
anything about this kind of call to action, Max, that you're talking about, you know, weaving conversations about reconciliation into your everyday? And um, one of the things I try to do to model, especially because uh, queer people of color, the assumption is our communities are always homophobic and transphobic. Mm -hmm. And I say to people, the same conversations I have at the boardroom table, you know, the honor to have this conversation with Max and Pfizer today, these are the same conversations I have with my parents. So how do we think about that kind of weaving that through and acknowledging a complex history that we may have been mm, sometimes distanced from. Mm -hmm. So some of my own work has been to kind of research and understand a little bit more about my own family context and only learning recently that my great grandfather was involved in um, what was called the kind of independence movement or um, he was a freedom fighter, that's what they call called them against the British in what we now call India, mm. um, which is interesting to be the other kind of Indian, um, <laughs> and uh, was incarcerated for about 10 years in um, what is now a UNESCO recognized heritage site, which is a really horrible prison um, on an island off the, coast, off the East Coast. And so thinking about the ways that we can draw into our own historical activist um, leanings to think about what we could do forward, right? How do we think about challenging structures? How do we think about, for me personally, that's been a great learning in thinking about prison abolition. That's been really important. Mm -hmm. And thinking through how do we have those conversations in our own communities? You know, I think one of the things I've really appreciated about your work too, Faiza, in having conversations about gender-based violence is saying not all women are the same, not all immigrant women are the same, not all Francophone women are the same. So how do we embed this conversation all the time, recognizing the complexity mm -hmm. and meet, you know, this has been said a lot and, and it gets said in, in our sector, meet people where they're at, but do we truly meet people where they're at? Mm -hmm. I know I got the time thing, but I want a little bit more time. Is that okay? Because <laughs> yeah. I really, I really want to ask this question um, around funders and priorities, and um, what some of us cheekily might say are sometimes we get to sexy topics. Some communities become um, uh, more important because of media things or because of uh, funder priorities. So each of you is engaged with work within communities that are often described as marginalized or in even some cases at risk. And I would love to have a panel to, to disrupt the idea of what we mean by at risk. Um, uh, for example, in the Peel District School Board, I live in Mississauga, one of the definitions is of uh, at risk communities are where there are uh, higher incidents of single moms. Mm. So what, what are we saying about communities when we make um, those kinds of correlations? So this can translate into dedicated resources, can, which can be great for people who are doing things on the ground. For example, work that's specific to reconciliation, perhaps, or mm -hmm. all that weird Canada 150 money, which people disrupted in really beautiful ways last year. Um, but it can also mean funders determining, funders and ministries acting as gatekeepers, determining targets and goals without comprehensive community consultation. Can you comment on this process of funder priorities, targets, and goals, and the ways in which this can impact community sense of well-being? Yeah. I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. So I will have an answer uh, pre last week and post last week, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, pre last week, uh, because so uh, please understand that I'm, re I'm really here as, as president of an organization. So it's a volunteer work. Yes, as a consultant, I, I, I work a lot with the, especially uh, violence against women, actually. And I had uh, the opportunity these last three, four years to. Um, to fill out so many, so many funding requests. And uh, it was uh, funny at time, actually, yes, to see that how many, how many, how many checkbox I can just check by the population I'm working with. Oh, woman, yes, francophone, yes, immigrant, yes. Okay, we're gonna get the money? Not really. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't, it's not really like this. It's, yeah. It stays underfunded, it stayed, uh, yes, as you said, the agenda is really fixed by the government. So. Um, and as an, as also, I, I'm a newcomer here, so it's just, uh, I'm, I'm just starting now to understand how do we get our, our, uh, our priorities into this agenda, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was really more like, okay, the government uh, see, listen, understand, and it's gonna come from top to bottom. I understood a few years ago, obviously, uh, that it's not like this, and you have to, to share so much, to educate so much, and so on. Um, to make sure that what you what you're uh, receiving is what you want and what you need really for your community, what you're hearing from the need. Um, that being said, uh, one of the one of the issue that I always had in the past, so pre-election, uh, pre-result, is the targets. Obviously, 
it's not about numbers, it's really about lives. Uh, when we are engaged into this, it's because it touches us, and I just hate uh, having all these numbers to, to fill out, because it doesn't say uh, the story, it doesn't say the reality, it just gives I don't know what to, I don't know who to share in a close space, so I'm really, uh, I'm really worried about this. Uh, how we address this as MOFIT is that we're working without funding, actually. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work that we're doing since three years, since I took the, uh, the, 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 the chair of the board, we said, okay, enough. We were just being reactive to what the government was requesting us, was identifying that is important for women, francophone, immigrant. I didn't want that. I wanted to reconnect, like for our team, for the board, for our volunteers and so on, to reconnect really with the population, really connect with the members and the citizen. So we listen. And you know what, there are a lot of things that we can do without money. Yes, I don't sleep much. Yes, thank you, my son, to, uh, pr to support me when I work on Sundays. Uh, but we are not alone. Like there's a real strong team of board members and members that are just doing the things that we need to do. And from that, we collect the data, we collect the stories, and I'm starting since few months, and I'm, re I'm gonna restart now to do it to go and meet those MPs and tell them this is what's happening. Because once we have actually the data and we document and we share things with them with the passion that we can do because we are activists and we are in this set things we do because it matters, sometimes they may listen. Yeah. That being said, uh, now everything is back on the plates. Mm -hmm. If I can say, I hope it's an expression that works in English, I'm just translating word to word. Um, what I'm afraid of is the education part. As I said, a uh, few questions have been asked for uh, we're new, uh, to our new uh, uh, prime minister-elect and to uh, his representative, and the answer regarding francophone was, oh yeah, I love Quebecois, they are my friends. We are more than 670,000, I think, francophone here. Um, it's, uh, it's about two-thirds of the francophone that lives uh, outside of Quebec, so there would be a lot of work to do to educate and to recreate those links and to make sure that there is a real understanding of what it means to be francophone outside of Quebec because that's what makes the Canada that we envision, not the real one, but at least the vision that we have for the future that can stay. Uh, what I'm concerned about, as I said or just pointed out, is the sexual education piece. Uh, discussing this, I think it's, or, or disputing this, is a, is a symptom very, very worrying for me um, because uh, there are things that will, that will have to be done uh, just to make sure that sexual violence against women just stop, and that's consent. A no is a no is a no, it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So how is it again disputed? And I'm really waiting for, I'm not gonna wait actually, I'm not gonna wait for the funding to come we will see and make sure once the prime, once the ministers are designated and the MPs are in place, that we're gonna put forward all these things and, and make sure that they are taken into consideration. We are citizens, we are part, of, I'm, I, I actually don't have uh, the citizenship yet. You could say, <laughs> I'm not even a Canadian, but I think that once, like the first, first uh, day I was arriving here, I had, I had the duty uh, to, myself, to my community, just because I, I can do it, and obviously to my son, uh, to just work around this. So we, yeah, we, I'm, I'm not gonna wait for the funding and to have the same targets and to have the same pressure that just keep us out of the real work that has to be done. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. I think just very, very quickly so we can get to, uh, get to audience questions. Um, I want to I want to speak to the to the EDs in the room, the CEOs, the administrators, um, to say that when you are in meetings with government, you can ask them about how they are continuing to support reconciliation initiatives at municipal, provincial, federal level. You can do that without uh, taking money away from other indigenous organizations. You can ask how they're supporting indigenous-led organizations. Uh, to complement the work that you're doing. All of us can make sure that this remains a priority of, uh, of governments at whatever level um, by talking about it, by continuing that conversation, um, by asking for 
uh, professional development opportunities and, and other opportunities to engage as workplaces. We are rich enough of a country that the support that you're asking for as organizations can complement the support that Indigenous organizations and Indigenous communities are doing as well, and that's the message that I'll leave you with. Amazing. Thank you. All right, this is uh, an opportunity for the audience uh, to ask some questions. Um, aussi, je voudrais encourager mes collègues en français de aussi considérer d'offrir les A parfaitement Marc, parce que je pense que la question de la langage c'est quelque chose de vraiment important de notre mm -hmm. discussion. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Uh, thanks for the uh, panel. It was really interesting and really intriguing, also in the same time. I'm from Cornwall, uh, a place where 25% of the people are speaking French. Mm -hmm. And my question will be to Faiza. Mm -hmm. uh, we struggle to make new immigrants who are Francophones get into the Francophone system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the system is built to make sure that <coughs> we're, gonna good, we're gonna make good Canadians who speak English mm -hmm. and will be contributor of the system. Mm -hmm. But in our region, we have access to French services, primary care, uh, mental health, and also schools. Yeah. And schools are not only Catholic schools, there's also public schools, so religion should not be an issue. Yeah. But the system seems, seems to be built to create, <coughs> again, that space. And you talk about safe space. Yeah. We talk about the, the, the kids, all, it's important, but also the moms and the dads who mm -hmm. are mainly speaking French mm -hmm. are pushed in the system in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they struggle to get their health care. Mm -hmm. They're not at the right place because the system don't push to send them to the right system. Yeah. How can we enhance that part? How can we how can we be stronger to make sure that being a Franco Ontarian a newcomer and yeah. coming a Franco Ontarian, it's not a barrier. It could be an advantage. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you talked about francophones. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> um, you talk about francophone not being directed to the right services. I just want to point out that it has been the case for francophiles also. Syrian refugees, when they arrive, some of them were living in Lebanon before. Lebanon has a dual system. A lot of their kids living their country, arriving in Lebanon, went through French school. They learned French. Arriving here, buses were getting into the hotels from Anglophone schools, saying to these kids and these parents, we're gonna take you. And none of them, none of their, par their parents heard that they were, learned that there were French schools also in this, in this uh, province and in this country. Uh, sorry. Being into the, the subject, I was about to say, shame on you. Shame on you. Because those kids, had to go through and their parents had to go separate like through a, so many so many more difficulties where they could have found those schools and it exists like I, I work for um, in, a, in a women's center uh, against violence and three years four years after arriving in Canada we have women and that gets into the center and oh I heard by word to mouth that oasis because it's always a center of women exists it's, it's terrible. They needed system, they needed a support right when they arrived. So get to back to the, the, your question. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's really a, an effort that will have to come from people in this room and everybody to understand that yes, language as we said is an opportunity. Uh, not just an opportunity in terms of culture and just law, it's also an economic development opportunity. When you have someone that comes from another country, and when we talk about Francophone, it's 270 millions market. So I know that the, the new government is really market-oriented and business-oriented. Imagine if we are really able to empower new immigrants, have their jobs, have their system here, have their connection, have their, um, their, their, their wealth, because we're talking about wealth and, and not staying into the poverty that having to spend two or three years to learn another language brought you bring you in or stay in Toronto and bring you in, that's a real strength. So please, when you have someone that speaks French or is Francophile coming into your services, 
I talk about Q, I talk about also all the other services that comes here, direct them to their community, direct them to their support system because we understand and we can connect and we can support. One thing that I hope will not change is that we finally gonna have services in French and at the gates, at the airport. Because you arrive at the airport, you give in this book, Ontario C'est Chez Nous, uh, nothing about French services, not one brochure about service, services. So that's one thing, really, please, 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 be conscious that it is important when you learn a language, when you come with one of this language, that you are directed to your services. And back to Cornwell, what I want to see really is our immigrants not just coming into Toronto. It's a very expensive city. It's very difficult to make a living here. I would love to have a system, and in a, I know it's organized. We have a great momentum right now within the francophone community. A lot of organization coming together, a lot of communication starting abroad. We have Creux des Parcs system and so on. So that's where we can make the difference and, and, uh, and have people directed to where they can have a better time for home. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go to the mic on the far side and I'm just gonna ask nobody else to come up to the mics. We'll finish with the four that we have there. I am going rogue as MC, just so you know. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, taking time for questions because uh, we've, I think, heard very loud and clear that that's important. So the far mic over there. Hi, thank you, Max Feinde, and thank you, Faisa, for that talk. It was, it was uh, well received. My name is Nancy. I'm a registered nurse at Taibu Community Health Center in Scarborough. Newly designated Francophone services we're offering. So. Mm -hmm. French. Identified, sorry. So my question is, um, we do work with uh, Francophone clients and they're very expressive, two to three kiss, hug. Um, do you find any um, perceived differences in what um, they consider sexual harassment versus what Canadians oh. would consider sexual harassment? And if you can further speak on the um, taking that sexual uh, um, education out of school, how would that further affect those yeah. uh, differences? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, absolutely, there is a, there, there is a big difference. Um, and that's what uh, Okasi, the Okasi project and the graphic novel brought to. Uh, one example, uh, yes, I could talk about Africa, North Africa, or so on, but let's, think about, uh, let's talk about French, uh, France, and what is considered sexual harassment in France compared to uh, Canada, just because it's white majority countries, uh, Catholic or Christian countries, so we don't have the other, the other elements coming into the discussion and, and the ignorance of the other elements also coming into the discussion. Um, in France, I could have, I'm with a skirt today, I could have my boss, and that happened, um, uh, my boss come and say, oh, nice legs, or oh, nice uh, cleavage, or whatever, something like this. That would not be considered as sexual harassment. It's just in the culture. We would say, oh, it's just, it's just a way, it's okay. But it shouldn't be, obviously. And that's something that makes us uncomfortable there, but we're not at, at that point yet. Uh, so there is a big difference. That's why also we had uh, tools uh, really separated and developed for both, both communities, like anglophone and francophone. Uh, the way that we can do that, though, is uh, sharing about the laws, what it is here, very clearly, what it means, what's accepted, what's not accepted, and um, also remind, again, that the, the advantages that were, or the successes, or the new laws that we have here, are just new. It's not something that exists in 200 years. Let's be reminded that it's just very, uh, something that has been very uh, quickly, um, just early. Um, for the future though, sexual education um, and consent, if it's taking out of the schools, we will have to get you engaged. Community health centers, organizations, uh, even maybe the media, just to have this conversation going. Um, the cultural aspect into this, again, if we, it's, when we talk about this and when we talk about immigrants, it's kind of, oh, Canada is here and everything is perfect and you poor people, uh, because of your religion or your culture, you're still struggling with so many things. But again, if I, if the first thing that I say is, look, um, in Christian majority countries, and I hope I'm answering your, your, your question, um, women were still struggling 20, 30 years ago 
And we also still have here in Canada judges uh, from the Supreme Court that will judge mm -hmm. a woman for how she was dressed or how she behaved. And he's not coming from another country. He lives here. Once you have this type of topics and this type of bubble, like ideal bubble, that is just growth, that's where you can have the conversation and the education going. You're not confronting, here it's better, uh, there it's, uh, I'm sorry, you, you have so much progress to do. No, it's everywhere. It's really, violence against women is really everywhere. It touches everybody. No distinction between culture and religion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Middle mic. Hello. Uh, my name's Linda, um, and I'm a, I'm a settler here. Uh, I guess um, I'm grateful to be able to live here. You know, I, I, I love it. I love it very much. Um, but one of the things that I've been uh, privileged to start learning about is, um, as you quite rightly say, the genocide that happened here. And uh, one of the things that's made me think about a lot is that, um, and one of the statements within that learning that I read was, uh, that indigenous people didn't have the opportunity to be the dominant culture in their own land. And when I read that, that really struck me and I thought, oh my God, that's, that's huge. And, uh, and it made me sort of, it forced me to look at and acknowledge the fact that every day I get to walk around with a lot of privilege. And with that comes a lot of power and responsibility. Um, and I wonder, uh, as I, try to humbly undertake a, a, a journey of sort of learning and unlearning and, and, and making better, as is my responsibility. Max, if you could speak to um, how can we, how can people, particularly if you're part of the dominant culture, become more aware of it um, uh, and uh, find spaces where we can give up power? Because I guess that's one of the things that concerns me is that I want to be able to give something up. And that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you, sure. yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's an extraordinary question. Um, recognizing the time, I'm going to keep it uh, short. Um, who is who is getting, uh, I think, you know, as, as was alluded to, who is getting rich off of reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Not indigenous peoples, I can tell you that uh, for certain. So this idea of giving up power is so crucial to reconciliation. If you look to recent budgets or or, or recent uh, federal actions, provincial actions, the money that is often given uh, to do reconciliation work, reconciliation program is is not indigenous led. Uh, you know we're. We're seeing more and more organizations hire one native person uh, so that they can now have access to these reconciliation bucks, right? Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. fill out their budgets to provide uh, programming uh, that is often still underfunded and, and done in isolation of the organization uh, without any of the other staff considering their care of, of how, to, how to challenge colonialism. Those are the types of, of things that, that should not be done anymore. And you know, I think for some organizations, it's done with the best of intention. They want to do something. And I want to assure everyone that there's uh, Native people, Indigenous organizations who are equally as capable of doing that work, who are better situated to find uh, those solutions, who are, uh, who are well-trained. In, in, the art of, uh, in the art of progress. Uh, so as, as I spoke to briefly, to find ways for your organizations to support and champion them uh, in your causes and in your situations and recognizing that yes, there is enough money for all of us. Okay, thank you. So if I can ask our uh, two final questions to try and be as concise as you can in support of the time, thank you. Mon nom est Nicole Levesque, euh, je siège au conseil d'administration de l'Alliance pour des communautés en santé et puis je suis membre du conseil euh, d'administration euh, du centre de santé communautaire de Capisquet signe et région. Uh, where I live, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank um, FESA for being a promoter, for being an activist, because we need more people like you uh, if we want changes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I don't have a question, it's more like a comment. Um, but I am worried about one thing with this new government. Um, I, uh, I heard Doug Ford uh, talk and he said that um, he, isn't, he wasn't sure if he would keep the um, ministry uh, for um, uh, francophones, um, I don't know how to say it in Francophone English. Affairs, yeah. Yeah. affairs, yes. So, um, and this is, uh, I think we have a lot of work to do um, with our MPs, uh, the ones uh, that were elected uh, with the PC party, um, to make sure that uh, we will keep this ministry. Thank you. Very brief answer. Uh, yes, it is. It is very possible that we lose this uh, this ministry uh, just before because he wants to restrain the budget and, and less people. But um, I have to say that what I'm what I'm really encouraged and optimistic about is that during the election, I could see like Mokif, we had some some actions uh, to engage, like to 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 really learn or teach uh, to immigrants and also to francophones to talk about their their. Um, their issues differently and to really go directly to the MPs. So please be sure that even if there are no Francophone Affairs Ministry, there are organizations now uh, that are really ready and um, leaders. So I'm, 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 thank you for your compliment, but I'm really not the only one. I'm just opening a door that you will see many, many other women uh, coming and they're ready. And we do have some elected also. And uh, we're just gonna get ready with, the, with, the, with letters and we're gonna be in their offices and we're gonna be uh, talking because if we are just talking in, on stage between us, they're not gonna hear us. So we're gonna start to send letters in French and send letters in English and be in their offices to, to make sure that they hear us. Thank you, final question. Um, I work in the area of youth mental health at Planned Parenthood Toronto Community Health Center for Youth. And I wondered if you could even give some brief tidbits about what you think uh, looking into the future, envisioning the future of youth mental health and what some of the challenges and opportunities you think exist there. I'm, uh, yeah, well, obviously I'm, I'm very worried. I could, um, from a non-specialist point of view, I could see just uh, issues and challenges more and more connected, technology being uh, one, one of them if it's not uh, well used. Um, to, get, to get back to your point, actually, of giving up Power. What I would like to see is, um, is different ways of envisioning our system as country, as citizens, as communities. Right now, the, 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 um, the speech and the, oh sorry, I'm gonna lose time just looking for my words. Uh, but the, merci. Uh, C'est comme l'esprit en fait de la, de la communauté aujourd'hui ou de ce que devrait être une communauté est vraiment dominé par une pensée centriste Okay, by a centrist, like very um, white dominated, uh, capitalistic dominated uh, thought of what a country should be. Uh, for example, just developing, uh, having more women into, uh, into uh, businesses, it should be uh, calculated to G GDP. What I would like to see for Canada, because we are in this land, is actually learn and relearn or rediscover other ways to, to live and what's important in our life. If we could re-identify this, adults, right now, what, like, recognize or, or re become or um, yeah, come back to other values, if we redefine our values outside of just being consumer, maybe we will be offering something to our youth and to our kids that is worthy and that will improve their mental health. It's not a just about services. Yes, it's important, services to support them, but I think it's, it's, it's broader than this. We have to, to change this, this, this system, really, and how our values are determined. And we are on a land where there is an am am amazing, a rich, a, a, a beautiful a way of seeing lives, of seeing connection between people, of seeing the connection with the land. We have climate change coming. How do we reconnect with this? I think it's definitely learning from you and, and having you lead what it is to be in the fu future and, and connect with the land. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm Max, do you want to close us up with sure. a couple of thoughts? Sure. So um, we know and we've heard, right, on 
on the National from Canada's ex-boyfriend, Peter Mansbridge, time and time again, uh, about the crises that exist in, uh, in Indigenous communities on and off reserve, the crises that exist for young people who have lost hopelessness. I was talking to Willie Littlechild, who was a commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He went in to speak to a grade seven class. I don't know how old a grade sevens are, maybe a 12 or, or 13, something like that. And, and they said, how are you today? And they answered, we're waiting. And they said, well, what are you waiting for? And they said, to die. Uh, there's, uh, there's an incredible, uh, incredible crisis uh, that is happening in our communities that is too often uh, forgotten on reserve and off reserve. Um, my, the future that I envision, I think the future that many people in this room who are doing this frontline work envision is mental health supports that recognize who we are, recognize our beauty and the knowledge of our elders, recognize that balance of the medicine wheel that is beginning to be talked about again that was not long ago outlawed to speak of. Uh, we're going to see the indigenous social determinants of health become more of a topic and more utilized in these services for our young people. We're going to see all of you trained in them as well. And that's Thank what you. I see for the future of mental health. Thank you. Can I interrupt? Just as I begin, our final thanks for our panelists. If Connie could start to make your way up. Oh, I'm going oh. to put my hand up really oh, quickly. Yeah. Really quickly. I just wanted to say thank you so much like for sharing you. space. And I want to encourage us to acknowledge the labor, all kinds of labor that it takes to produce and think through the knowledge and share the knowledge that both Liza and Max have done today. When you think about taking this back to your own communities or, or your organizations, or even as you're retweeting it on Twitter and Facebook, Think about the labor. Think about ways to acknowledge labor without consumption. And I'm so honored. I'm fangirling a little bit. You're both so great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to uh, absolutely to Max, Faiza, and Anu. Really appreciate it. This is the work. This is the conversation. Uh, and it is our responsibility to take time and create space and honor, as you said, the labor within this. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, once more, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.